Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second video of the Practical OpenStack uh, video series at Kernel.com. My name is Anton Koneluk, and we are continuing our discussion about the OpenStack. In the first video, I have taken a look in what the cloud computing is, what are the resources available for us in the cloud computing, and how to use them. In this video, we'll talk about uh, why we have chosen OpenStack as a platform which we are willing to describe and discuss when we talk about uh, cloud computing. So first of all, why do cloud matters, right? Everyone is talking about the cloud today, but what is so exciting about the clouds? Why everyone is talking about the clouds? Why everyone is pushing for the cloud career right now? Um, where this is all coming from? The very first thing that cloud gives you is uh, an opportunity to decouple the infrastructure usage or infrastructure consumption from the infrastructure support and development and maintenance. What does it mean? As said earlier in our first video, when you deploy the application or basically for users, only what they need is an application. The users of the application don't care about the infrastructure. Likewise, the developers of the application, which runs through the infrastructure, all they care that A, infrastructure is there, B, infrastructure is there in the necessary amount. So meaning we have the needed amount of CPU, memory, uh, the reasonable uh, ratio of the deployment or of the, the reasonable various or the reasonable amount of CPU and memory dedicated to different VMs and also possibility to quickly reallocate the necessary resources or scale that faster. And uh, they quite often are willing to test with various types of resources, types of deployment scales, and therefore they would like to get access uh, directly to the provision of the resources in the way that they do understand through their various APIs or through their, I mean, in the programmable way, through basically the code that developers write or something similar to, without need to talk to infrastructure department, write them the tickets in Jira or any other systems, any AI guys provision for many VMs and like the whole crazy process starting, taking time and so on and so forth. So ultimately it goes down to the simple point, the quicker the developers can get the resources meaning they can control the allocation of the resources and deployment themselves without involvement of third parties, such as infrastructure department, the quicker they could develop the application, the quicker they can do uh, deployment of the application production, and the quicker the, the company could start serving the customers and earning the money. This at least in the theory. So that is why the clouds as a approach, self-service approach of the development of their infrastructure and deployment of the infrastructure is uh, getting that attractive and a negative that needed these days about speed and uh, control of the usage by the people who are really using them, not some middleware ones. So if you think about the cloud, again, recapping what we have in the previous um, topic, we said that each and every application could be from the infrastructure perspective, uh, boiled down to uh, three types of resources, computing resources, networking, and storage. Computing, this is at least about the CPU, number of cores and their frequency, as well as RAM. Networking is about the provide connectivity between the computing instances and uh, computing storage instances, as well as value-added networking services such as load balancers and firewalls. And third is uh, block storage and object storage components, which provide their a possibility for VMs to store information persistently or even to provide certain informations accessible uh, to various um, uh, compute instances in the form of objects or files and so on and so forth. So imagine that this pool of the resources, computing network and storage are available for you somewhere in some cloud platform. So how the people can use the cloud? There are typically, two main interfaces. This is a UI, so user interface, where we have some uh, buttons, typically web UIs, uh, some uh, drop-down menu, some pool bars, where we could say, okay, I would like to allocate this amount of the VMs with this memory and CPU and this operating system. Click, 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 click. Uh, and a number of uh, few clicks, or probably quite a few clicks, we get our platform developed, which is 
good for training purposes, which is good probably for some people who are onboarding. But if you think about the high scale deployment, that's still quite far away from uh, where it should be. And this is where the API available on the cloud platforms come into the game. So the tool of choice, which are normally these days either uh, Terraform or Ansible, we could uh, run the deployment of the resources. So we could uh, request a number of VMs with a certain amount of CPU and RAM and the certain network and connectivity and the certain uh, services and the certain uh, um, amount of the disk and so on. So first of all, something that we could run in a, a corresponding sequence, get uh, those uh, resources uh, for us like available and uh, deploy them just in the matter of running a, a single uh, Ansible playbook or a single like their form common. So this is where the, actually the power of the any cloud platforms coming from, as well as we have reasonably good UI and API. Obviously, from the operator of the cloud operator perspective, there are other things matter, such as billing, such as accounting, what is user, how is using, but uh, for the user of the platform, the application developers, or DevOps team, and others, those elements are key. So thinking about uh, these uh, elements, so UI, API, and then some cloud platform think, or available, uh, or I mean, computing network and storage resource available on some cloud platform, we naturally come to a discussion over the point, what type of the clouds do we have these days? There are two types of the clouds, are public and private clouds. Public clouds, uh, there is quite a huge amount of them. Honestly, these days we have just listed three, the most popular, probably everyone have heard about them at least everyone who is interested in the topic of their cloud technologies. This is AWS, this is Microsoft Azure and GCP Google Cloud Platform. So as said earlier in the, our first video, we still, for any application to run, we need CPU, we need memory, we need networking connectivity, networking services such as firewall and load balancer, and we need storage, block storage and um, uh, object storage. So when we talk about the public cloud, it just means that this resources is in some way else data center. They still exist. So when we say the cloud, it means there is certain servers which are running certain um, directly on the bare metal workload or which are running their uh, VMs, which are running the containers, and you just give the access to them uh, through their internet. So in this case, you generally don't care about the infrastructure as such. You obviously not care about maintenance of the server and expanding their memory and CPU or other things. You just care about your workloads. If anything is broken in the corresponding um, public cloud underlying our, our infrastructure, depending on your uh, tariff, you could be automatically migrated to another one with retaining all the data. It could be migrated with the data loss. Could be that you need to rebuild something, but generally you are not in any capacity involved in uh, fixing underlying infrastructure problem. Your application uh, continues working, or you do the steps to remedy only your application. This is different to the private clouds. The private clouds, this is an infrastructure is in your data center. By your data center, I mean it could be indeed your on-premises data center. It could be that you are renting certain services from a. Um, Collocation providers such as Quinix Metal or uh, TG Hosting or any others, where you put uh, your, so where you uh, sublease bare metal service, you put your clothes on top so that your managers, uh, their, uh, at least their operating systems, so um, VMware, AS6s, uh, vSphere, Cloud Direct, and so on, or OpenStack. There are others, private clouds, operating systems available starting from relatively simple and though quite the full popular use such as Procmox, Proxmox um, and some others or like more complicated the set of VMware OpenStack. Uh, in this market, probably uh, the biggest and the most uh, competitive cloud operating system. So in this case, you are caring about also at least operating system level. Obviously, if you deploy uh, the uh, VMware cloud or OpenStack cloud in your uh, prem and you're owning the infrastructure. So you're also caring about servers and storages and all other things. So ultimately, 
the answer you might implicitly say, okay, in case of public clouds, I care only about the application and don't care about the infrastructure at all. Uh, this is quite appealing, right? Because why, why at all I need to care about the infrastructure if I cannot do care? Well, the question is quite reasonable. However, the answer to the question is not as simple. The very first thing is following the joke that I have recently seen in the LinkedIn. How do you end up in property, my friend? Gamble, drugs? No, I just left AC2 instance. Uh, AC2 is a name of the compute instance in the AWS. So the reality is that uh, the promise of the public clouds, it is cheap and it is on demand. So you're really uh, paying only for the time you use a service and the times when you see it inside could be very, very low, like 0 0.01 uh, US dollars per hour of application running or 0 0.1 US dollar per application is running. But the deal is always hidden in the detail, right? So their uh, application, especially when we think about the big services, uh, uh, streaming platform, gaming platform, they require a lot of compute, they require a lot of memory, and they need to be constantly online. And when you could start multiplying these tiny, tiny prices that are always being uh, like flagged by all the cloud providers, and you count uh, all the costs that you need to run for your infrastructure, even over a month, because this is a pure OPEX cost, right? So operational expenses, uh, you pay them recurrently, uh, monthly, you could figure out that probably over a year, the prices that you need to pay for public cloud platform could be that high that it could be cheaper for you to buy all the hardware yourself, build the proper cloud, hire the team who would be supporting the cloud and developing for you, and it all will be just pays paying out back to you only in one year. So um, I heard quite a bit of the stories where the company was saying, screw that, I go public cloud 100%. They were going to some of the public cloud providers, they were staying with them for one or two years, and they were saying, screw that, it is hell expensive, I'll go back and I'll deploy properly OpenStack because this just will save us an enormous amount of money. So ultimately, the, the point is that, yes, for a lot of small startups, the public cloud could be good, but mainly for the development uh, stuff where you either uh, run the resources occasionally, I mean, so you don't claim the 24 by 7 huge amount of resources, but just a few hours per day, or where you have some extra bursts that, yeah, we need to have certain extra capacity for one or two hours of for one day. So you don't run this constantly. So if you really depending on the uh, online and uh, your application consumes quite a bit of resources, the second point, the workloads, which are heavy and long lasting, just need to be run on 24 by saying, they would be a quite a money uh, drainer. So think about them when you are deploying uh, the resources and do the proper calculations before you put anything on the public cloud. It might be the public cloud still fits you, but beware about this. Always count on, oh, the cost per hour per T1 micro is so low. Well, yes, but calculate it over the size of the VM that you need and over the over period of time. So the next important point about the deployment of the application when you deploy it in the public cloud, obviously it's very good, but you can deploy it only in the location where the public cloud exists. Uh, to be honest, for many applications, uh, it would be enough. For example, uh, AWS has a quite a huge amount of the data centers worldwide where you could deploy your application. Obviously, there is a different cost in deploying the applications in different data center, even within the certain geographic region. So it might be cheaper to place their, for example, application in the um, AWS in one US city, then and in another one, it all regulated based on the available capacity and the demand existing in the market. But generally, as said, so this uh, this could be right, and that could be even cheaper than to deploy it in somewhere, I don't know India or China region. But obviously, you wouldn't be deploying the application to serve US in the India just because uh, latency uh, for communication over the uh, Pacific Ocean would be very very huge, right? So physics are there so and uh, their uh, like speed of light is also limited uh, on the other hand certain application might be required to be uh, delivered uh, like shall we say middle of nowhere if you think about the 
telco cloud application, we would like to deploy virtual BNG or virtual security gateway uh, closer to the base stations or our FTT customers, and we would like to deploy a small uh, scale hyper-converged uh, cloud instance where we will put our virtual BNG number of the Azure Act application where the private cloud could be a very uh, good uh, solution to do that. And the last one, but not least, is expertise. Um, here, Palau public clouds are winner almost daily. I saw, I see uh, people posting, hey, I'm right now AWS expert networking, and I'm Azure 10 times certified guy. I'm not saying it is bad, it's good because all the knowledge are good and it's very well to understand how the platform is working, especially if your companies deploying the apps uh, there. And uh, in the same time, this is a point that you need to consider when you choose a platform to deploy, whether it is easy to find the specialist with a certain platform knowledge, multiple platform knowledge, or, but same is applicable to the OpenStack or VMware, or you can find the specialist who knows uh, that type of the infrastructure. Plus, obviously, if you deploy the infrastructure on-prem, you need also to have people who have knowledge of, um, physical uh, infrastructure aspects such as memory, uh, servers, networking switches, and so on and so forth. So always do these calculations. Uh, the last point which we put into this video would be, why did we choose OpenStack ourselves? So first of all, we started saying that uh, they need after actually evaluating a few use cases of the company who was going to the public clouds and going back to the private. So the need for the pub private cloud is there. So talking to some uh, service providers, communication service provider, how they are now called, uh, there is a need to have the telco cloud solution where you need to deploy the applications on prem rather than in cloud for different types of workload, 5G, FTTH, and others. So there is definitely a need for this platform. Second, and for the big cloud platforms, yes, for the huge amount of middle, like small to medium business companies running their own open stack uh, would be probably overkill just because you need to find the corresponding platform unless the CTO or any other tech uh, folks, I'm, I'm referring to the CTO because normally the people who run is a special in the startups the infra, but someone who in the core team knows how the open stack works. So if there is such knowledge, obviously there is a, a huge benefit of running the platform yourself because you could tailor it to your needs, you could scale it, and really the cost effectiveness of the platforms could be quite high. So OpenStack is uh, open. So therefore it's an open source. You could read all the code, you could contribute to the code. There is no hidden backdoors. You know how it is working. If you see certain errors, you could figure out reading the code where it's coming from. It's all just Python, which is very good because the knowledge of the Python on the market uh, quite, um, uh, shall we say, distributed. So it's quite easy to find uh, someone who knows Python and would be able uh, to understand the Python code of the OpenStack. Not saying would be able to extend it, but at least help by the troubleshooting. Second thing is maturity. OpenStack exists for 12 years already, probably even for certain years. And uh, uh, over this period of time, a lot of platforms were matured. A lot of um, components of the OpenStack uh, were improved. In fact, the OpenStack is used by the huge amount of the big uh, online companies, or research companies. I wouldn't uh, say the name because I haven't worked with them yet myself and repeating the OpenStack slides really out of interest for myself. But uh, from what I have seen, uh, the companies are, uh, who are using OpenStack, yes, they are big, but they are benefiting from that a lot. And the last but not least, OpenStack is supported both by the individual contributors and various vendors. There is a number of uh, companies uh, who are providing also commercial version of the OpenStack and commercial support of that, meaning for the companies who are uh, looking to have a more or less traditional enterprise-ish approach with companies supporting them, uh, I mean, some third parties supporting them uh, could uh, do this with OpenStack. The last but not least from the OpenStack is a flexibility. OpenStack has a huge amount of the components. You can deploy some of them. You could deploy the core components, such as uh, components providing user storage services, networking services, compute services. If you're willing to, you could extend it by adding the load balancer as a service or firewall as a service or a telemetry collector as a service or uh, container uh, 
uh, Linux container management as a services and many, many other things. So uh, you could also have possibility to choose even within the uh, certain components, uh, let's say some sub components. For example, if you're talking about the uh, open stock compute services are different hypervisors available. You could go with a KVM, which is the most popular, probably the most robust um, Linux um, hypervisor, but we could also choose to go with Xen, or if you're doing the demo, we could go with a Camu, or we could go even with integration with the VMware. So the point is you have a flexibility and you have a possibility to choose to tailor OpenStack to your environment. For you, I mean, for the people who are consuming the OpenStack through the API, so developers, DevOps guys, there will be really no difference. They will, will not uh, be aware about what you run in the backend. This is a quite a beauty of OpenStack to create necessarily all the abstractions. And they said, um, we, in the modern world, what we also see OpenStack has an interesting, uh, shall we say a second breeze. So with the development and uh, faster distribution of the continuous application, uh, some companies are looking the way how to simplify the deployment of the containers and they're deploying their containers within the VMs, provided that VM infrastructure is everywhere the same, uh, simplifies their rollout of their uh, container platform. Because if you have VM, for example, in one cloud, public cloud and private cloud, but you manage the VM yourself, you could within the VMs deploy the uh, Kubernetes or any other container orchestration and manage the connectivity between them uh, using their something that's called hybrid cloud or multi cloud approach. So, in this case, OpenStack is a very natural step in deploying the uh, part of the hybrid cloud on prem in your on premise data center, the data center where it is in just hardware. Uh, the last point I already touched there are free and commercial versions of OpenStack. So depending on your company profile, you could uh, choose to deploy entirely everything yourself from the latest and greatest OpenStack features, which by the way, the last version of the, the latest version of OpenStack, not the last one, was released less than one month ago in the end of um, April 2000, well, not on the end, the beginning of the April 2022. And there are also commercial versions provided by the biggest Linux uh, suppliers worldwide, such as Canonical, which are the Ubuntu uh, and um, Red Hat, which is uh, the Red Hat Linux, CentOS and all the things. So you have opportunity to choose. So just choose what better suits you and go with that. <laughs>